And so we are in Romans chapter 8. If you have a Bible, you want to open up to Romans chapter 8. So we look at our message, A New Life in the Spirit. Paul the Apostle wants to share with you and I how to have the experience of the abundant life. And that abundant life is communicated to our hearts and to our lives in a very real and intimate way through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Paul the Apostle mentions the work of God's Spirit in some 20 different ways in this passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 8. And so it's a a new life in the Spirit. And yet, unless you've tapped into that new life and experienced the quality of life that the Lord wants you to have, you are really living not a new life, but you're just living the old life warmed up, which doesn't really bring much fulfillment. There's a lot of weariness and toil that goes with it. Usually we're still stuck in the old sin and habits of our past that God wants to set us free from, and it really diminishes the quality of life. And I don't know about you, but I want to live the, the abundant life or what God has for me. And so there's some things that I need to know in order to live that good life. We have some relatives, and uh, they're both retired now. They've worked hard their whole life, and now they've finally uh, went kaput, if you will, with work. And, and, and they have 20 acres, and that's been a lot of work. So they've worked full time, and they take care of their 20 acres, and they've raised hay, and and cows, and horses, and all the different things, and they're just kind of worn out, they've shared with us, and they're just tired of taking care of the place, and, and, and so we have another relative, and this, this relative has a condo in Hawaii, and this relative said, hey, why don't you come to Hawaii and live for six months? They said, okay, when? And so they said the first week of October. So they're going to be leaving next week, and they're going to go enjoy the good life, if you will, that place that people equate with paradise and perfect weather year-round and beautiful beaches, and they can sit on the beach and watch, watch the whales play and dolphins and different things in their season, and they're just so excited. And I want you to know that they are not going to miss anything. As a matter of fact, they told us, don't expect us for Thanksgiving. Don't expect us for Christmas. We're going to be in Hawaii, for heaven's sake. Why would I come back from Hawaii to hang out with you guys? Now, I understand their perspective, and I just pray that, man, they would have a blessed time in Hawaii. But, you know, for some of you, that sounds pretty appealing, doesn't it? You're like, whoa, wouldn't that be nice? Hawaii. It's a condo. No lawn to mow. No weeds to spray. No, no kind of burden or, or weariness. I'm going to go to this place in Hawaii. Now, I want you to know that spiritually speaking, Paul the Apostle brings us into the spiritual Hawaii of the soul. You don't even have to get a plane ticket. Isn't that cool? The Lord can do a work in your heart and your life on the inside internally that can change the way that you look at life. But that's all communicated by the Spirit of the living God. The Holy Spirit infusing the life of the believer with his power, with his abundant life. Now, there are seven things in this passage I want you to take note of if you're a note taker. And these are the things that we discover in the Christian life that the Spirit of God wants to produce in us. And the first thing in our list is a new victory over sin. It tells us in verse 12 and 13, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You see, the Christian life, if you're going to enjoy a quality of life, you need to have a new victory. And he uses this illustration of debt. Now, most of you understand debt. Those who are in the financial uh, counseling world, they say there's two things. There's something called good debt and there's something called bad debt. Bad debt, credit cards, miscellaneous things that really uh, high interest and it doesn't help you out in the long run. Then there's good debt. There's like your mortgage. Uh, The house of an American is the number one place of savings in the family of an American. before savings accounts and 401ks and all that stuff, it's, it's paying on a house. So you have good debt and you have bad debt. And yet all of us know what it is to service debt. If you're an adult, you get that mortgage coupon, you got to mail it out or it's automatic, it's online, and you service that debt. You pay that check every month so that you can enjoy having a roof over your head. Now, if you cease to pay that debt, what happens? They come and ask you to leave. 
They say, hey, we're foreclosing on you. You're not paying the bill anymore. You don't get the benefit of this roof over your head. Move down the road. Now, Paul tells us in this spiritual sense, he said, you know what? You're no longer debtors. You're not debtors to your old sinful flesh. Because if you sow to the old sinful flesh, you will die. It's not only sin ultimately brings death, but it's a daily death that diminishes the quality of life in our lives. And so Paul says, hey, you don't have to be a debtor to that. It's as if that's all paid off. Jesus paid that debt. You don't have to pay my sinful nature, my old habits. It rises up inside of me and says, hey, why don't... You know, you used to like to do this, or you used to like to say that, or you used to like to think about this, or what about that? I said, you know what? I don't owe you anything, my old sinful nature. I don't owe you a thing. Jesus paid for the price there, and I don't want to keep servicing that debt to my old sinful lifestyle. I, I, I want it, in a sense, to be foreclosed upon and shut down. But by the Spirit, I want to put to death the deeds of the flesh, my old habits, those things that are not productive. They bring guilt and shame, and they diminish the quality of my life. And it's, how do I do that? By the Spirit of God. In the weaknesses of my life, I say, Lord, I'm weak in this area. I need your strength to put this down or to get rid of this or to cut this out of my life. I need your help and your power and your strength. You see, in order to live the new life in the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, you have to learn how to have victory over sin that has dominated your life. And through Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, through our identification with him upon the cross and the newness of life, we now have the power. Romans chapter 5 told us that Jesus has delivered us from the penalty of sin. Romans chapter 6 says that Jesus has delivered us from the power of sin. So for the first time in my life, by the Spirit of God, I can put to death, I like the King James, mortify just kill it. Mortify the deeds of the flesh, okay? So if I'm going to have a quality of life and enjoy the newness of life, ask yourself this question. Is there some area of my sinful life that is still dominating me? Is there some area of my sinful life that I'm basically still paying the mortgage on? And you don't have to. You don't need to. So why are you doing it? If by the Spirit He will enable you to put to death the deeds of the flesh, then do it. Put it out of business, if you will. Number two, he tells us in verse 14 that we have a new identification with God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Who are those who are sons of God? Those who are led by the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God enables you to put to death the deeds of your old sinful nature. But then he leads your life and changes your life. And now you're identified. People look at your life and they go, wow, you don't think the way you used to think. You don't talk the way you used to talk. You don't act the way that you used to act. Now there seems to be this lifestyle. And they, even when they can't put words to it, they can't articulate it, they say, man, you're different. You're different. You're different at work. There seems to be this love and this joy and this peace that you have. And, and I've never seen you have that before. It seems that you, you're more committed to your wife than you've ever been, that you seem to be a better father than you've ever been. You seem to have a desire to do good things where that was never a part of your life before because you see the Spirit of God marks those that serve God and you're led by God's Spirit. See, there's a lot of people that claim to be Christians that are not being led by the Spirit. You look at their life and the way they think and the way they talk and the way that they act and the way that they live and you go, man, you're about as far away from the things of the Spirit as it possibly could be. And people look at you and they don't even know you're a Christian because there's no evidence to point to the fact that you might know Jesus. But those, they have a new identification when they know the Lord because you're led by the Spirit. I was on a trip to Israel many years ago, and in downtown Jerusalem, it's a very packed area. The streets are very narrow. It's easy to lose some of your members of a tour group. You might have 40 people in your tour group, and so the, the tour guides there, especially uh, in, in all the different places, the sites you go, there's all of these tourists passing each other, and you can lose someone. And so they're very, very bold in how they identify their group. They give everybody the ugliest bright orange hat you've ever seen in your, your life, and all of them are wear, wearing bright orange hats. And, well, 
It's obvious what group you're with. Or they go with bright lime green. Or sometimes the leaders, they, they, they carry these flags, and it's like they're marching through the city, and they have this flag, and, okay, everybody follow our flag. And because they don't want anybody to get lost along the way. Think about that. In your life, the Spirit of God is the one that wants to lead you. It's not some tour group going through the, the streets of Israel. It's an invisible work of God's Spirit in your life that should transform the way you think and the way you talk and the way you live, the way you act, and the way that people perceive you. If you and I are just like the world, how will they ever be drawn close to Jesus? Ever. Because there's nothing different about us. We think like they think, and we talk like they talk, and we act like they act, and there's no transforming power. Jesus said in that day, there's going to be a group of people that come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name? We did that in your name. And Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. You used my name, but you were not led by my spirit, and you lived just like the world, and I never knew you. Therefore, also the world also could not be drawn close to the things of God through you. So, number one, there's a greater victory in sin over sin in our life by the Spirit of God. There is those who are led by the Spirit have a greater identification with God. And thirdly, we also have a new intimacy and relationship with God. He says in verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of a bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. He tells us here that we haven't received, when we came to the Lord, we didn't receive a spirit of fear, of bondage. You see, before you come to the Lord, you're in a spirit of fear. Oh, man, even though you might not articulate this, deep inside, hey, I know I'm not right with God. I'm living a guilty, shameful, sinful life. I'm not right with God. And if I died, I'm afraid. I don't know where I'd go. Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? I don't know. I'm going through life without really any confidence because of the guilt and shame that sin produces in my life. And so he hasn't given me that kind of spirit of fear, again, in bondage. You see, when I came to the Lord, when you came to the Lord, we now have a spirit of adoption. And that spirit of adoption cries out, Abba, Father. Now, Abba is this Aramaic word that means daddy or papa. It's not the Swedish band from the 70s some of you are thinking about, Abba, okay? Abba is a term of real, real familiar intimacy that Paul the Apostle uses it here in a shocking way to the Jewish mind. The Jews so revered the name of God when they came to the name of God in the Old Testament they actually took out the consonants so that they couldn't even pronounce it. And when they read, they would read the verse all the way up to there, and then they would say, the name. They wouldn't even say the name. Therefore, we lost touch. We don't even know whether you pronounce that name, Jehovah or Yahweh, because it was unused for so long that we don't know, because the Jews said, the name. And for Paul, a Jewish rabbi, now born again through faith in Jesus Christ, to say, now we have the spirit of adoption that cries out, Daddy, Papa, Abba, Father. It's, it's not the spirit of fear. It's the spirit of a child's love for his father. It should be the safest relationship, the most fulfilling relationship, used in human terminology, if you will, for a child growing up, that relationship with a father, with a mother. As a matter of fact, you know that the first time the Bible uses the term Love, it's not between a man and a woman, between a father and a son. And so here we have this cry from our hearts, Abba, Father, I've been adopted by God through faith in his son who loved me and died for me on the cross, shed his blood, was buried and rose from the dead. Now it makes a way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me, a new and living way that I can come to God with a prayer life. Think of this. I don't know if you pray like this. I pray like this personally. I don't do it on Sunday mornings. I don't do it in front of people because it freaks them out. Hey, Dad, you know what's going on in my life? You know what this, what's happening here, what's happening there? And just to even go from the term father to dad or papa makes you feel 
like you step into that place of intimacy that is so safe and so secure. Years ago, my son and daughter were going to Ammon Elementary School over here. It was during the football playoffs, and the weather had turned cold, and um, my son said, hey, Dad, on your day off on Monday, because I'm a preacher, so uh, I take Mondays off, and he said, would you bring the football down and play football with my friends and I at recess? I said, sure. So uh, I didn't think of anything. I thought, well, you know, you got to call the principal. You don't, as a, you know, strange guy show up on the playground unless you want to leave in handcuffs. So I called the school and said, hey, you know, uh, my boy wanted me to come down and play with him and his friends at uh, lunchtime recess. Is that okay? Yeah, that's okay. Please check in with the teacher on duty. And so I said, okay. So I showed up and I had my football and I don't know what I was thinking. I was just thinking of my son and his three or four friends that we were going to, you know, I was just going to play some catch, play a little game of football. Whatever. There's hundreds of kids on the playground. So I didn't really think about that. So when I stepped on the playground and my son saw me and his boys came, came running over, my, my son was, hey, dad, dad, you know, and, and, and I, <laughs> he ran up to me with his friends. Well, when the other kids on the playground realized I wasn't a teacher uh, there for authority, but a dad that came to play, I was in serious trouble. Because the playground just went like this, <laughs> all around me. And then I'm around these... And I was really, I didn't know what to do. I was freaked out. I'm like, I was just going to play catch with a couple. Of, now there's 100 kids around me. And then some wise acre in the crowd said, get him. <laughs> they attacked, they, they like squished me and attacked me. I said, no, don't knock me. I'm going to hurt some. <laughs> you know, and down I went, landed on a couple of kids. And I'm thinking, well, I told them I was coming. And now they know my name to arrest me because I'm going to injure a kid on the ground. And they... <laughs> They all got up, and they were giggling about things, and I'm like, you can't play football with this many, but you can play soccer. There was a soccer ball across the uh, playground. I said, hey, go get the soccer ball. So the mob you know, <laughs> took off after the soccer ball because you can kick the ball around with 100 kids. But after I got up, there was a kid that, though the kids were scattering towards the soccer ball, a little kid came up to me, and he wrapped his arms around me, and he buried his head in my stomach, and he said, my daddy, my daddy, my daddy. And he was saying it really loud. And, and I looked down at him, and I could see the top of his head, and my boy was sitting over here. And my boy was looking at that kid like this. <laughs> now, I do have a sinful past, but as far as I know, this was not my child. <laughs> Just saying, okay? And so... I was, I was really a taken back. Not, I mean, I'm uh, kind of discombobulated through this whole thing because kids are, I mean, tackling me, and I thought I was just going to play pass with my son and his friends. And now this kid's hanging on to me in a loud voice saying, my daddy, my daddy. And I thought, wow, they're really going to arrest me. <laughs> and one of the kids that was standing next to my son said, oh, that's so-and-so. His mom and dad got a divorce about six months ago, and his dad hasn't been back since. And when he told me that, this verse shot through my mind, the spirit of adoption, crying out, Abba, Father. And I, I had to kind of compose myself and choke back the tears because here's this little boy hanging on to me for all of his might. And I was just the closest adult around that he could hug and say, my daddy. You see, the human heart longs for intimacy not only with their human father, but longs for intimacy with your heavenly father. So you're designed for it. You're wired for it. Now, this is where some people stumble in their life because, you see, a lot of people, they haven't had a good relationship with their dad. They haven't had a, uh, their dads have been neglectful or they don't know them or they, they ignore them or they're abusive or they can never please them or they're sharp mouth towards them and they ridicule them and they put them down. And so when you think about loving God like your dad or your papa, it doesn't compute. There's a disconnect. There's actually a stumbling towards that because their image in their mind is so distorted and so broken and so not right that they have a hard time getting over that hurdle. But Paul the Apostle says, you know what? If you want to live a new life in the Spirit, you're going to experience God's Spirit inside crying out with a spirit of adoption, Abba, Papa, Dad. 
You see, when that happens, there's a new intimacy that you have never known in, your, in, in this existence. When I received Christ at the age of 19 and realized that the Father in heaven was my Abba or my Papa or my dad, it transformed my life. It transformed my life. I realized I've, I've got this heavenly Father that loves me, that gave his son for me, that sent his spirit for me. And he wants me to live in this quality of life, this abundant life, this new life in the spirit. And this is how we get there. Do you have in your heart that spirit of adoption crying out? Is God your papa? Is he your daddy? Is he your father? Is there that intimacy that that brings security and safety. You know, when you think about your dad, you think of somebody that is safe and loves your mom and, and he's the anchor and he's the provider and he's there with love and truth and discipline. And, and no matter what, he's never going to fail you. He's, he's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He's never going to let you down. That's the dream of a child's heart. That's the dream of a spiritual child's heart. He not only takes us through a greater victory of sin, a greater identification with God, and a greater intimacy in our relationship with God by the Spirit. The Spirit of adoption produces that. But He gives us a greater confidence through this process by His Spirit. It says in verse 16, the Spirit Himself, the Holy Spirit Himself, bears witness with our spirit, our human spirit, that we are the children of God. Now I have a greater confidence because, you see, I have this witness. Picture a courtroom and and somebody on the witness stand. The Holy Spirit's on the witness stand saying, I testify, I witness that this person knows God. You see, there's a strange thing that happens when you get saved and the Spirit of God comes inside. You might have received Christ just last weekend. You prayed, you asked the Lord to forgive you of your sins, you received Jesus as your Savior, and now you know God. And if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, do you know if you're going to heaven? They say, yeah, I am. Well, show me in the Bible. I I don't know the Bible yet. I just got saved a week ago. I don't know anything. Well, how do you know? Well, I just know deep inside. Well, how do you know, though? Well, I just know that I know that I know that I know that I'm saved. You see, there's not only the objective truth of God's Word that declares it to be so, but there's the subjective truth of the Spirit of God that is inside of me bearing witness with my spirit. Do you have this confidence that you can look at somebody and say, I'm going to heaven? Now, I have, I've been accused of being arrogant when I've said that. Somebody asked me, well, do you, you know what's going to happen when, when you die? Well, sure, I'm going to heaven to be absent from the bodies and be present with the Lord. Well, that's so prideful of you that you, you say you're going to heaven. I said, how can that be prideful of me? They said, well, because you think you're good enough to go to heaven. I didn't say that. I said, you asked me if I know I'm going to heaven. I said, yes. But I'm not going because of me. You see, the child of God is going to heaven based on what someone else did, what Jesus did. The Father's love sent his son, died on the cross, rose from the dead, sent his Holy Spirit, and God's done the deal. Jesus said, it is finished the whole plan for salvation. So all I have to do is believe it and receive it. So how can that be arrogant when I say, I'm going to heaven, God's perfect heaven, because of his perfect son? It's not my fault. It's not my fault. I can't get there if I want to. It's the only way to go, you see. So ultimately, the Christian's life, even though people might falsely interpret your confidence or your assurance of salvation with arrogance, it's an absolute confidence and assurance in the finished work of Jesus. And it actually magnifies and exalts Jesus, who he is. You and I are just broken, fallen sinners that, man, we're getting, aren't you just glad to get in the door? Man, I'm glad to get in the door to know Jesus as my Savior. And so I have an assurance. I have a confidence. If I died right now, if I, if I just, boom, I'm gone. Aneurysm goes off on my brain. I fall to the ground. I'm dead. I'm going to be absent from the body, present with the Lord. Don't waste your time trying to revive me And if you do revive me, I'm going to punch you right in the mouth. I'm going to leave all the bills to you guys, and I'm leaving. I'm going to be with Jesus. It's graduation day. Do you have that kind of assurance? Let me just ask you. If you died right now, do you know you're going to heaven? Well, I don't know. I don't know if I've done enough good things. You can't know until you get there. Well, isn't that a little late? 
I don't want to wait till I get there to know if I made it or not. Tell me now. I want to know. And so I have assurance. You should have an assurance. Look at a couple of verses that should give you an assurance if you don't have it. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 tell us what we need to do and what we need to believe. It says in verse 9 that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised, has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Then in verse 13, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Let's try it out on the count of three. Just say, Jesus is Lord. One, two, three. Jesus is Lord. Okay. Everybody that said that? Cool. You got it out there. Then it says that if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead... If you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, on the count of three, I want you to say yes. One, two, three. Yes. Okay. You confess with your mouth. You believed he raised him from the dead. You are a saved soul, even though you might be trying to mess it up all week long. <laughs> you are saved. You're in the door. You're doing good. Isn't that? You go, well, yeah, but I don't always feel that confident. And I don't know. Some people are just nervous Nellies. Every other week they're wondering, Pastor, I don't, I don't know. I think I might have committed the unpardonable sin. I said, you have not committed the unpardonable sin. How do you know? I said, because whoever commits the unpardonable sin never comes to ask the preacher whether they did it or not. <laughs> they're in the bar right now having happy hour, and they don't want anything to do with us. When you have an oversensitive conf- conscience, sometimes you don't have a great confidence or assurance, and you need that. Another verse I want to leave you with, probably the greatest verse of assurance in all the New Testament. If you haven't jotted it down before, you should now. 1 John chapter 5, verse um, 13 says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know, notice that, You can know, you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. I can know that I have salvation. I am now filled with confidence. I don't believe that you personally, as a human being, I do not believe you're ready to really live this life to its full till you know what's going to happen when you die. Because once I know what's going to happen when I die, I'm not afraid because that's the scariest thing in all of life, isn't it? That's the scariest thing there is in life. No, there's scarier things. I don't think so. I don't think so. Now that I know what's going to happen when I die, I am ready to live life fearlessly. Not foolishly, but fearlessly. Like those bumper stickers, you know, the little window stickers. No fear. Because perfect love casts out fear. Because I'm not afraid of the judgment of God. Why? Because all of the judgment of God that would be coming my direction was all poured out on the sun at the cross. Okay? So, Number five, we have a new inheritance, which is good news. It says in verse 17, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. Number six, we have glory. It says, in, if, if indeed, in verse 17, we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified. So there's a glorious destiny for us. And number seven, the hardest one to swallow Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory with which shall be revealed in us. A new inheritance. Some of you have family, and maybe you're 60, and your pop's 85, and he's been a wealthy man. He's been successful in business, and he has a home here, and he has one up in Island Park, and maybe he has a beachfront place or something like that. He's got a lot of money. You're an only child. You know that all that wealth, and your father has assured you that that inheritance is for you when he passes away. You look forward to that inheritance, not that you don't love your father, but one day when that happens, you're assured of that inheritance. Well, the child of God, the Spirit of God, wants you to know that you have an inheritance. It's a spiritual inheritance. The Bible tells us that we're going to inherit the kingdom of God, meaning that I'm going to inherit heaven, a, not a pile of gold, but a city of gold and streets of gold. And the, if you want to know how awesome heaven is, check out chapter 4 of Revelation and chapter 5 where there's worship in heaven, and then Revelation chapter 21 and 22 that describes heaven with a river of life and a tree of life, and there's no more tears, and there's no more sorrow, there's no more pain, there's no more temptation, there's no more sin, there's no more of all the stuff that ruins our life and diminishes the quality of our life. And so, there's an inheritance for you, but it's heavenly, it's not earthly. But this is what he tells us, 
that there's also glory for us because along with that inheritance is the glory of God and that we are going to experience a glorious destination when we get to heaven and have glorified bodies. But number seven, this is the kicker, he used the S word, suffering. He said, if you suffer with the Lord Jesus in this life, you will be glorified with the Lord Jesus in the next life. If you suffer here, this is the way of the cross, and there's a crown up in heaven for you. Now, this is human nature wants instant gratification now, meaning I don't want to suffer now. I want all of my pleasure now, and if there is any suffering, I want it in the future. That's the worldly person's future. They're going to go for the gusto. They're going to live like the beer commercial says, you know, going for it, living a life of sin, and they're going to totally go for pleasure now, and then they're going to be eternally separated from God where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, outer darkness, a place called hell, the lake of fire. So they're going to go for all their pleasure now, and then they're going to suffer for eternity. But the child of God makes a conscious decision. No, I want to receive Christ, and because when I receive Christ, that's really unpopular. There's a certain amount of suffering that's going to go on in my life as a Christian. Not only as a Christian, but with life circumstances itself. I'm not exempt as a child of God from sickness, from disease, from financial hardship, from persecution, from all kinds of things. There's a lot of suffering in this world. And I don't know about you, but I'm not a masochistic guy. I don't like to suffer. I don't like to suffer. You like to suffer? It's not like I go through life like, man, I can't wait to wake up today and suffer. (laughs) I wake up every day going, I want to be blessed. I'm a member of the Bless Me Club. Oh, God, bless me with love and joy and peace. Bless me financially. Bless my health. I'm Mr. Bless Me Club. I love to be blessed, don't you? Who wants to suffer? Don't sign me up. But this is what he says. You're going to suffer now, and you're going to have glory forever. Or you can enjoy the human, fallen, sinful nature glory that is a poor imitation, and then you can suffer forever. Let's put it this way just for a little illustration. Some of you are kind of, you were really into the message about what God's Spirit is doing in your life until it came to the S word, suffering. And now you're checked out like, "Mm mm-mm, not doing that. Let's put it this way. What if this week I said, you know what? We have a ministry. It's called the suffering ministry. Okay? And we take turns. So, uh, out at, our, out at our small group, there's, a, you know, there's the Truth Project, there's Marriage, Love, and Respect, and there's all these different things. And then there's the Suffering Small Group, okay? And so we, want, we need about 20 people to sign up for the Suffering Small Group, and uh, uh, you guys are just going to suffer with each other. You're going to cry, and you're going to weep, and, and it's, it's going to be a, a whole lot of fun for about a week. And so we're going to put that piece of paper out there for you on the table, I can guarantee you not one person in this room is going to sign up for the suffering ministry. Not one. That's a, well, there may be one mentally unstable person in this room that says, oh, that's me. Oh, I suffer good. I love to cry and be depressed. and weep. No. The majority of us say, I'm, I'm going to get away from that suffering thing as much as I can, right? But what if I say it this way? You know what? Whoever signs up for the suffering ministry... We need 20 people, and we're only going to take the first 20 people, and you're going to sign up for suffering this week. Now, I know you're going to suffer for a week, but the following week, you're winning the Powerball. You're winning the lottery, and right now it's at $480 million. So, first 20, people would die from being trampled to death to get to that. Right now, if I said that, if it was for real, there's people that would jump up and be running right over the top of your head to get there. What, they would be running to, to sign up for suffering? No. They want to win the Powerball the week later, right? Now, how many of you would be willing, that was just hypothetical, I'm just asking for audience participation, how many of you would be willing to suffer for one week if you could win the lottery the following week? Raise your hand. Because some of you people are total liars right now. Just, you're... <laughs> You're just straight up lying through your teeth. I mean, just liars, liars, pants on fire. Okay? You're sitting there all spiritual. I wouldn't do it. I don't play the lotto. It was hypothetical, folks. 
So the rest of us, we're signed up. I'm at the first of the line. If I would suffer for a week and I could win the lottery next week, it's bring it on. Why? Because a week is so short to suffer, right? A week is so short to suffer. That's how the Lord describes this life. He said, your life is so short. I'm asking you to identify Jesus with Jesus. And when you identify with Jesus, there's a lot of, uh, well, there's a lot of things that happen with that. Some people don't like Christians. They don't like our message about Jesus. They don't like the morals that come from the Bible. They don't like that we stand for what's right. They, they don't like a lot of those things. Then there's the other suffering as well, staying close to Jesus through the trials and adversities of life. I might get sick. My wife might get sick. She may pass away or I may pass away or something harmful may happen to our children or we might get in a car wreck or this might happen. Some kind of incapacitation may, may happen in our lives. And you see, most people that don't know Jesus or even say that they know Jesus, as soon as they go through a rough patch of suffering, what do they do? They get mad at God. They get angry with God. How I thought God loved me and look, he's letting me go through this. And this is a thing that you can't compute in your human brain. I know that God is big, able, and sovereign, and powerful. He could overrule in all the affairs of men, and he's let this happen. How could that be love? Well, I want you to know I never give up what I know for a question mark of what I don't know. And this is what I know. The Bible clearly tells me God loves me. He loves me. And he has his best in mind for me, always. He loves me. He loves you. He has your best in mind for you. And because of that, when I suffer, it drives me into the arms of Jesus. By the way, those arms and those hands, they, they have spikes, scars in them, and feet. Crown of thorns upon his head. Jesus knows what it is to suffer. And the Lord Jesus, Paul the Apostle says at the end of his life, in Philippians chapter 3, he said, I just want to know him. That was the passion of Paul's heart. I want to know the Lord. I want to fellowship with his suffering. And I want to know, I want to be conformed to his death that by some means I may attain to the resurrection. This is what the Lord promises you and me. I'm, prom I'm promising you glory now, or excuse me, glory in the future, but right now there's gonna be suffering. There's a, cross, uh, there's a cross to bear now, but there's a crown later. The devil's gonna come whisper in your ear. He's gonna say, no man, go for the glory now. Don't worry about it. I mean, eternity's never gonna happen. There's no heaven, there's no hell. Don't worry about that. Instant gratification for the desires of your sinful flesh. But God is opposite. You see, what he says is this life's a vapor. The Bible says that our life is like a, a fog that rises in the morning and it's gone by afternoon. It's like the grass that comes up today and the July heat burns it up the next day. It's like the shadow that comes and it goes. It's as swift as a, a, a weaver's uh, shuttle that goes whoosh, 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 whoosh. That's how fast your life goes by. Isn't it true? When you're young, you don't compute that, that life is fast. When you have gray hair and the li your life has went by, you go, I cannot believe how fast this life went. Some deep theologian has said that life is like a roll of toilet paper. The smaller it gets, the faster it goes. <laughs> my dad just celebrated his 75th birthday yesterday. And over the years, I've asked my dad, what does it feel like to be in that older body. He says, you don't know, son, how hard it is to be an 18-year-old trapped in this thing. <laughs> because though our mind, you know, our mind can be young and feel like uh, you, it can still do these things, and then you go try to act like a 20-year-old, and your body says, fool, what are you doing? <laughs> the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. I wonder how many of us here today are enjoying a quality of life that the Spirit wants in your life. You see, it's new life in the Spirit. It's a greater victory over sin. It's a greater identification with God. It's a greater intimacy in our relationship with Him, a greater confidence and assurance in our relationship with Him. We have this inheritance. We have this glory. But I want you to know, Paul says, it's not to be compared. Paul uses, he says, I reckon in the King James. And that's a term that means to weigh things out. You see, in the old school of scale, you might have a scale in your bathroom. Maybe you get on it to depress yourself. And uh, 
you stand on that scale, right, and the numbers come up or whatever they are. I have a, I have a digital one that I weigh myself once a week just to make sure. I'm trying to keep at that 190 uh, spot, and I know whether I need to starve myself for three days or not. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, it's my goal to be 190 and you just, just, just stay right there. Just stay right there. So, but the thing is, in the old school scales, there was always something on the other side of the scale, right? So everything weighed like this, kind of like a teeter-totter. And so in my, Paul's mind, this is the picture he gives you and I. He said, on this side, on this side, I want you to put all of the suffering and hardship and difficulties that this life brings, okay? Got it in your mind? You're living through it. You've got a whole history of that kind of baggage in your life if you're older. If you're younger, you might be going through a real difficult time right now. And he says, okay, weigh that on the scale. And so it's weighed down all the way to the ground. And then he said, now I want you to put the glory of God in the heavenly promise on this side. And Paul says, he goes, boom. He said, the two are not even worthy to be weighed against each other. There's not any comparison. Zilch, not a zip. You cannot compare the two. They're so unbelievably opposite and incomparable. It's almost insulting to compare the sufferings of this life with the incredible glory and future that you and I have in our inheritance in the heavenly scene through faith in Christ. You know what does that, that does for me? I realize now through the hardships I go through in life, I'm going to go through them. And so are you. I'm going to go through suffering in this life. And so are you. And I got a choice to make. I'm either going to get bitter, angry with God and let that drive me away from God, or I'm going to embrace it and run into the arms of Jesus who suffered and who now is in glory. And Paul the Apostle, who suffered. You see, Paul was an expert in two things. He was expert in suffering, and he was an expert in glory. And as we close here this morning, I just want to let you know all about that. Because you might not be familiar with Paul's life, but listen to him describe it in verse 24 of 2 Corinthians 11. He says this, For the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. He was whipped with whips. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Shipwrecked three times. In in journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleepness is often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Paul said, and I have suffered, and I want you to know, that Jesus is worth it. I've never been beaten for my faith in Jesus. How about you? I don't have one scar to show. I've never bled for the name of Jesus. And yet I go around, if I get a hangnail, I'm whimpering and whining about, oh, my great suffering. Here's a guy that's beaten five times with whips. He's beaten three times with rods. He's shipwrecked three times. Spent a day and a night out in the sea. Can you imagine? I would hate to be a day and a night out. All I would hear all night long is, da-dum, da-dum thinking some sharks are going to eat me up. Paul was an expert on suffering. Like, as far as we know, no missionary of all time. Nobody compares. He was an expert in suffering. But he's also an expert in glory. For he says in the very next chapter, in verse 4 of chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, how he was caught up in paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Paul, through a vision he had, the Lord took him up into heaven, and he saw the very glory of God in the paradise of God. He saw it. He saw the glory of God. He said, you know what? It was so glorious, it's unlawful for me to even try to describe it to you. Now, people today would have written a book about it and went on a book tour. But he said, you know, I I can't even tell you about it. It was so glorious. So what Paul had is he had all that suffering I read about in chapter 11, 2 Corinthians, and then he had chapter 12, the scene of glory in paradise, and he went, bam! There's no comparison to what's ahead for the child of God. But I know some of you here today, I know some of you here today, you are choosing the sinful lifestyle of this world and the pleasure that it's going to bring you for a short time 
and you exchanged it for the glory of God. And it is the worst business deal, spiritually speaking, you will ever do in your entire life. But there are many also in this room that have been suffering. And they look forward to heaven and the glory of God. And they know now it's a cross because one day there's going to be a crown. And Paul said it this way, I have fought the good fight. I have finished my race. I have kept the faith. And there is now laid up for me a crown of righteousness. But not for me only, but all who love is appearing. There's a crown of righteousness for you. Folks, you and I are pilgrims. We're passing through. This world is not our home. We're strangers. We're pilgrims on our, on our way through this, through this life. And home is heaven. And one day graduation day is going to happen. And we're going to step into the eternal realm. And we are going to tap into our inheritance and the glory of God. And this behind us that we thought was worthy of too much focus of suffering is not worth spit. You're going to look back and go, it's nothing. The scale goes, bam, with the glory of God. And I pray that the glory of God, through Christ Jesus our Lord, would grip your heart and your life so that you can run this race with endurance for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your incredible uh, truth of your word. And we pray that you would just do a work by your spirit that leads us into a place of just real fruitfulness for your name and for your glory. Lord, we pray that you would um, touch hearts. I know there are those who are here today and they're suffering, Lord. They're going through a real hard time and, and they're tempted to be bitter. They're tempted to be angry with God. They're tempted to throw in the towel. And Lord, they have come to your house today, not by accident, but by divine design to set their hearts and minds upon you, Lord Jesus, and the glory that you've promised for those who serve you. And so, Lord, we pray that you would just do that work in our hearts, draw hearts into a saving knowledge of you and place of trust in you, and help us endure this uh, race that we're in, Lord, to run with endurance. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.